climb aboard the famous car once owned by silent film actor Fatty Arbuckle on the next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah learns of its past, and Roger uses acrylics to paint the antique on. d'Elegance, which is a wonderful show of antique automobiles and race cars, and they're the very finest quality you will see anywhere. Let's look around a little bit at some of the other cars. This is Jack Nethercutt, who has a fabulous car collection of his own, a car collection museum in Silmar, California. And uh, this is one of Jack's cars, and it's got a fame to it because it's one that Fatty Arbuckle used in the movies. Well, actually, it was his car. It was his car. Yeah, he was chauffeured, obviously. He didn't drive it, but he was chauffeured. Um, but it was Fatty's car, and he would go to on location, on sets, and there's an awning that hangs on the back of the car that he would sit out. And the trunk was full of liquor, uh, so, you know, he would enjoy himself while he was waiting in between scenes. He had refreshments on board. Oh, yes. And now, would he sit right here where we're sitting? Yes, he would. And he had a driver, and did he have a friend that traveled with him? Uh, Fatty was known to have a few ladies, yes. Um, in fact, that's what got him into trouble. Oops. And this car was chosen for him because it's powerful? or Actually, I think Fatty just liked this car. It's, it is it is rare. Uh, it's a 1923 McFarlane. There's maybe 20 of them left, none of which are town cars, which this is. And lots of leg room. In the back seat, yes. These old cars, the back seats always had a lot of leg room, but the driver had none. None. It just when you drive this car, your knees are approaching your chest. Oh, interesting. We'll have to take a look up front before we leave. And I see you've got privacy curtains. Privacy so curtains all around. If he needs them. Well, I hope we can get out to the Los Angeles area and visit your museum sometime. It is open Tuesday through Saturday. It is free of charge to the public. Amazing. And uh, we have guided tours and. Um, in one building and another building is self-guided. And there's about 200 cars on display. But it's not just cars. Uh, we have the third largest theater Wurlitzer organ in the world. We do concerts. Uh, we have a steam locomotive and a parlor car, fully restored. So there's all kinds of things to see. Well, we're lucky because Jack has given us permission to paint the car. Now, not literally paint the car, but Roger has fallen in love with the looks of this car, and he wants to take some photographs so that he can make a nice painting of it back in the studio. Roger's always been a Fatty Arbuckle fan, and so this makes it a special challenge and special fun to take pictures of this back to the studio and paint there because it's too crowded here. It's in full bloom today. Hundreds of people are milling around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate it. 
I love these strong shapes to this car so we can deal with these large circles. We've got rectangles. We've got all kinds of beautiful shapes. We've got nice reflections to deal with. We've got some good color contrast. And doing a painting of a car head on like this gives it a special appeal for me. It just gives it a real strength and a real design quality. So this is what I'm going to paint. Well, we've arrived back here at our St. Augustine, Florida studio now, and I'm going to start this painting. This canvas is much larger than I usually use, so I'll be working on part one of a part two program today. My canvas is 30 by 40 inches, and I've put a coat of modeling paste over the surface of this. This modeling paste gives the canvas some texture, so if I do choose to paint rather thinly, the painting will still look like it has some body to it. The modeling paste is white, but once that was dry, I put a thin coat of burnt sienna on here just to get rid of that white surface of the canvas. It's always a bit intimidating to start out a new painting. The question is, you know, where do I start? Well, first off, I made an accurate drawing in pencil on this canvas. I have quite a few paints out on my palette today. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, alizarin crimson, naphthol red, cadmium red light. I have a purple and Indian yellow. This is a three quarter inch brush I'm using. I'm actually not sure what color I'm going to end up with on the background of this painting. I'm just going to start by putting in this pale blue green. If I spray the board like this, lets my paint flow around the canvas much quicker and easier. Now I want this background up here to be rather flat, not totally flat, but I don't want a whole lot of brush strokes showing. And the way to accomplish that is to get enough paint on the canvas and not put it on in small little strokes, not, not go like this, not cover the painting one little stroke at a time. Just attack it as a house painter might be painting a house. Just put it on in a big way like this. And really work it around. Once you get, once I get it on like that, I just brush every which way, back and forth, horizontally, vertically, sideways. It only takes a minute or two to do that and I don't end up with a lot of small little brush strokes. I'll end up with a nice flat background with some subtle variations in color. Well, I think I'm going to start by putting in some dark colors, which will be down in these wheel wells, up in the window. And of course the radiator is dark, but I, so I'll put it in dark. Then after that dries and later on, I'll put in that grid work of uh, chrome. I think I'm going to keep the colors more vivid than what I actually see them in the photograph. So I'm going to make these dark colors down here, a very warm bluish purple color. And the same thing on this side. Here again, if I want to get this flat, I just brush this in here, put enough paint on there, scrub it all around, make a nice flat area. And then with a light touch, I can just fan that out. Perfectly flat. I'm using the same color up here in the window. It helps a good deal to have a good solid drawing on here to begin with. That way I can concentrate on the painting and I won't have to think about if this drawing is correct. I've got all those issues solved already. Well, now I'm going to start to put in these red colors here on the body of the car. We have a very dark red under here. I'm not going to worry very much right now about the detail. I'm just going to try and get these big shapes in. Just block these in as, as large areas. I did take a number of photographs of the car, so I have lots of details on these lights, the license plates, the radiator, and so on. I'm trying to pick out all the dark areas on this photograph. This is very different than working on a landscape painting. On a landscape painting, I could make 
big areas of, of trees and all, but here there's, a, there's so much small detail that it's a little more difficult to actually find and isolate all these big shapes. The red on this automobile is not a deep red. It's, it's a beautiful red, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, an odd color. It looks beautiful on this car, but it's not what you would expect. While these areas are still wet right in here, I might as well just work these areas and start not only trying to find these big shapes, but uh, blending them somewhat as I go. I'm taking some cerulean blue and white. And I'm going to put that at the top of these fenders because that's where it's getting the light from the sky. It's a nice reflective light. Now all the photographs that I have of this car are digital photographs and I'm viewing them on my small laptop computer here. So the nice thing about that is I can zoom in and zoom out of these pictures so I can go in and look at the detail. It's much better than printing it out on a piece of paper. I might as well just continue up. There's a spare tire back here. It's catching a lot of sunlight. Even though it's a black tire, it's I'm not seeing it as black at all. I'm seeing, seeing it quite gray. I'm tempted to put some burnt umber out here to make some grays, for instance, say in this tire here, but I'm going to resist. I'm going to just use these primary colors in a variety of reds to try and create that. I think if I start to use earth colors like the burnt umber and so on, uh, it might dull this painting. I want to give this painting as much life as I can. And this tire would be catching some of the reflected light from this red fender. So that would tend to make it a bit more purple color. And again, up at the top, it would be catching the light from the sky. So we might get some reflection at the top of this tire. When I do round objects like this, I'm very careful to feel this ellipse coming all the way around. I don't want to just come up here with the ellipse and stop. I want to feel that go all the way around to the other side. So even if there's some tire treads in here, I feel this coming up and then I hit my brush on the canvas and come around. Come up and over. This Indian yellow is the only color I have on the palette other than these reds and the blues. So if I need to make something grayer, I need to add that yellow to it. This is a warm gray color. I want to be sure those headlights are, are nice and round. I'll use that same gray color Put some white in here. This is where some of these highlights go on, the, on that light. The burnt sienna underneath here is a good thing because I can still see some of this burnt sienna shining through some of these areas. It keeps me from having to cover everything quite as much as I would if there were white under there because there's already a tone under there. And then I can sometimes just leave that dark tone alone, that dark warm tone, let it just shine through. I'm going to jump around on this painting. I don't want to finish any one area completely. So I'm going to jump from area to area. That way I may be able to complete the painting all at once and not just finish one area at a time. The paintings usually work out better for me that way. I can get a feeling of the entire painting by working on these large areas. And then it all comes together at the end. If I try and totally finish one area up in here, it may affect the way I think about the other areas of the painting. So I try and keep, it, keep a balance going. So this is done to a certain degree, and then this is done to a certain degree. Then I can keep going back into these areas and finishing them more and more all the time. 
This way I can stop at any one time if I want to, as long as I get the whole thing covered. Extensive amounts of detail in this area, then that would require me to put extensive amounts of detail in these other areas, which I may or may not want to do. So that's the reason I like to finish these paintings a little bit at a time. Finish this, finish that, then go back, finish this some more, finish that some more. It's really hard to know what some of these shapes are. But this is a town car, which means the driver sat out in the open, out in the weather, and Fatty Arbuckle sat in the back. So right here we have, looking through this windshield, this windshield flips open, we have that, and this red part back here is the front part of the coach that Fatty Arbuckle sat in. So there's a lot going on there. Right here is this glass visor. It's catching some of the light from the sky. So as this windshield flips open, and then it comes right across here. The windshield. I had a Model A four years ago and the windshield opened like that. It was really nice. Here's the Here's the steering wheel right in here. I really can't tell what all these reflections are in here, but I just have to go with my photograph and uh, my memory as to what this car was. It really helps to take a lot of photographs at different angles when doing something like this. Here I have a hint of the steering wheel coming around here. need to put a highlight right across here and to make a nice straight line I'll mix up some white and cerulean blue I'll mix it rather thin and really load my brush up with the ruler just hold that on there and use a few fingers here as a guide oh, and I can spray this with some water that'll help this paint flow across that area better. Since this blue was already wet, I'll add a highlight here and this light blue, this white will blend right into that light blue right on these edges. There's what is called a glass wind wing right here. And it's catching a lot of the reflection from the sky, so it's this blue color. And I'll put this in there as one large solid shape to begin with. And then while it's still wet, I'll add some other subtle colors in there and some reflections. Some white, load my brush up. And I'll take my ruler once again, use these fingers right here as a guide, and just put a highlight right down on this edge. And another right across the top. Right back here, there are some gorgeous small lights and I won't be able to show those in detail but they just show up here there's a change in value changing and another highlight right down on the window there ultramarine blue alizarin crimson Touch of Indian yellow. It's going to make a very dark color. And we'll put in this cowl light. Not cow, but cowl. C O W L. Cowl light. There. And the bottom part of this is in shadow. 
So this is going to be darker down there than it is on the top. I think we'll make it all that same color and the same value to begin with. So I'll just put the same color around as a circle right around that light. And when it dries in a minute or so, I can put some touches of highlight in there. Well, I've blocked in both these lights here. I'm going to leave that be for a while, jump down here and work some more on these larger headlights. On the overall photo of the car, these headlights didn't have too much detail, but I did take some close-ups of them. So I've switched over to that photograph now, and I'm working from, from a photograph that has much more information on it. So now I'll be able to add the details of this glass more accurately. Top of this headlight is catching sunlight. So I'll make this a warmer color by adding some yellow in here. I used a compass to uh, make these nice and round. And since it was a straight head-on shot, I was able to do that. Also, that assured me that both headlights were exactly the same size. On one of our trips, Sarah and I traveled out west and got to uh, be on Route 66. And uh, I did a number of paintings there at one particular place. Here, I'll show you a few of them now. It was a small roadside stop in Hacksbury, Arizona, with nothing else around for what seemed like 100 miles. From that one stop, I have done maybe a dozen paintings, and I could have spent an entire summer there making paintings. Of course, these automobiles were nothing like the one I'm painting now, but the charm of it really did catch my imagination. There are some vertical ridges on these lights. I'm going to put them in after I put these reflections in here. So we'll add those once this dries. I'll spray my palette, take my razor blade, and clean this off. This painting seems to be coming along. I just have to keep at it, keep blocking in these areas. I'm going to mix up a dark color with ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and Indian yellow. I'll put more alizarin crimson in there to keep this warm, but that's going to give me a very dark color. A touch more blue, I think. I'll block in this radiator as a solid mass. And then later, I'll put the grill work on there. Now, if I were working in oils, this would be a whole different process, a whole different story, because I would have to wait for days or who knows, maybe even a week before I could put the grill work in there. But this is going to be dry in really a matter of minutes. You can see how this paint is kind of dragging in here. Well, if I spray this, see how it flows much more quickly, much easier. That's why I keep spraying it. I'm getting variations of color in here. Some areas are cooler, some are warmer. I don't want it to be solid, one solid color. A few little variations will help make the painting more interesting. I don't have any particular plan as to the order that I'm doing this. I just decided quite arbitrarily that I would start with a background and work the way I am. But it's very much a, a piecemeal sort of process with a painting like this. On this particular piece, I'm not sure it really matters where I start. Could have started right here with a uh, dark radiator. Well, this license plate is a bright blue, so I'll take a combination of cerulean blue and ultramarine blue. I don't think I'll mix any white with it. I have lettering on here right now that I can see. I am probably going to lose that lettering. Although if I thin it out with some water, I might be able to see through the lettering. No, I really can't, so I'll just have to put that on there at a later time. Just 
redraw that on there. Here, I'll let this whole area dry here. Then I can start putting in the grill, the lettering, the more details on the license plate. Now I think I'm going to work on this grill. In the photograph, the grill is picking up a lot of green from the grass. And although I have some green back here in the background, I think I'm going to keep this in the blue range. I'm going to vary these colors, make some lighter and some darker, just to give it a sense of reflectiveness and make it look like chrome. With a new brush that has a nice sharp chisel point on it, even if it's a large brush like this, I can make a quite a fine line with it. Once it gets worn though, and the bristles start to spread apart, then that's no longer possible. I think my next step is just to fill in all these remaining areas with some kind of color and value that's close to what I'm seeing in the photograph. Well, I'm enjoying painting this interesting car, but that's all I can do for right now. And I'll finish this painting in the next episode, Fatty's Antique Auto Part 2. What's the top speed of this? I have no idea. Shall we try? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not here. Yeah, actually, the engine is, is quite big. It's 572 cubic inches. Uh, it's got four valves per cylinder. Uh, actually, four spark plugs per cylinder. Um, it's a huge engine. So he could go fast if he wanted to. Yeah, it depends on how, how it's geared, to be truthfully honest with you. And, and Jack, how did you acquire this car? My father acquired it. Uh, interesting thing about it, we were asked to bring it, and it had not been started since 97. And it turned right over. I can't believe it. Oh, it did. Just put a battery in it, made sure there was fluid, you know, it turned right over. Well, that's fun to hear about it. Uh, and it's nice you can carry on your father's passion for the rare automobiles. Yes. They really are works of art, and it's always so exciting to see one. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com. If you'd like to order a copy of this episode of Painting and Travel or any one of the programs in the series, log on to paintingandtravel.com. Each DVD contains three programs and costs $19.95.